All right, so we've already gone through the details of this five-stage pipeline and discussed what happens in each stage. And I said I would defer the discussion of loads and stores until this video. So, you know, early operations, you know, get done in this third stage. And they do nothing in this fourth stage. And then they do register right over here. But loads and stores are a little bit more complex. And they take, you know, these two entire stages to finish their task. Okay, so, you know, before I start discussing loads and stores, let me give you, you know, just some background on what is a risk versus a cis process, because that this is important in understanding, you know, how loads and stores play a role within your, uh, within your program. Okay, so risk refers to a reduced instruction set computer. And what it means is, you know, each instruction is very simple. Okay, so, you know, you can have ALU instructions such as in add, like we've discussed so far, you know, add R1 plus R2, write the result into R3, right? Or you can have an R instruction that also does, you know, something similar, or the values in these two registers, write the result into R3 and so on. Okay, you can also have a load instruction which says that, you know, I want to get a location in memory and put that location into some register entry or a store which does the opposite, which says that I'm going to take a register value and I'm going to place it in some location in memory. Okay, so note that our hierarchy looks something like this, right? You have your processor, which is your CPU. You know, it has an ALU which does the math. It has a register file which stores a few values, right? So this might have register values R1 through R32. And then you have a much larger, you know, main memory space, you know, which starts at address zero and perhaps goes all the way to say, you know, four gigabytes. Okay, and so you know, your main memory is really where you're storing all of your values and results, and the register file is a small scratch pad that represents a very small fraction of this main memory. Okay, so anytime you want to do some math, you want to get some location in memory and place it in your register file, right? So, you know, from memory, I'm going to get something, place it in R1. Similarly, I'll get something from memory, place it in R2, and then I can do R1 plus R2 quite, quite, quite easily, right? And that is what is referred to by a reduced instruction set computer, where, you know, things like adds and ors only deal with registers. So before you can do an add, you need a preceding load, which gets something from memory and brings it into R1 and does you know, and similarly get something from memory, place it in R2, now you can do the math. And then once you're done with all of this, you store the result away, right? So from R3, I put the result back into some location in memory, okay? Now, in complex instruction set computers, so CISC, which is, you know, complex instruction sets, so people in the 80s were figuring out that, you know, now that we have so many transistors on a chip, let's try to build these fancy functional units. Okay, so if you look at your program, you can identify that you know, some sequences of instructions are extremely common. And so you can replace a sequence of instructions with one very complex instructions. Okay, one example is, you know, let's say that what you observe in your program is that you often do you know, R1 times R2, write the result into R3, and then you add R3 to some kind of accumulating register, R4, and so you're basically incrementing R4 with um, the product of R1 and R2. And so people saw that, you know, this is a very common sequence of instructions. Let's replace both of these with a single instruction, which is called multiply accumulate, where I just do R1, R2, and R4. So basically, basically multiply R1 and R2 and add the result to whatever is now sitting in R4. Okay, and this led to, you know, very, very complex instructions. You know, this, this is, you know these, these CISC instruction sets and an example is Intel's, you know, x86 instruction set, you know, has hundreds of instructions. In addition to all of these complex sequences of instructions, you can have instructions that access memory, right? So you're allowed to, for example, do, you know, add where the operands are actually sitting in memory. So take a location from memory, add it to another location in memory, and write the result back into some location in memory, right? So this is allowed, right? And so complex instruction sets were basically these um, uh, these, these sets of instructions that allowed, uh, that allowed you to do all kinds, of, uh, all, all, all kinds of crazy stuff. Whereas risk instructions are very simple. They're always doing simple operations on registers, 
And if you wanted to get something from memory, you have to do it with loads and stores. Okay, so over time, people have realized that you know risk is the way to go, because not only does it lead to simpler hardware, it also leads to higher performance. And that higher performance firstly comes from the simplified hardware, which allows you to have a faster clock speed. It also allows you to easily figure out what are the dependencies between programs, and it enables out of order execution, which is something we'll discuss later. Okay, so the the bottom line is that even a complex instruction set like you know Intel's x86, which is CISC. If you, if you buy an Intel processor, you know, what happens is these instructions are read in. The first thing that happens is a translation which converts these CISC instructions into RISC-like instructions, and they're called micro-ops. And then from that point on, the rest of the processor is like a RISC processor, which, which almost entirely deals with these micro-ops. Okay, so you know, almost every processor that we'll discuss in this class is going to be a RISC processor. Okay, so let me again, you know, get back to the bottom line, right? As I said, uh, we'll focus on risk, where you know you will have simple ALU instructions, which you know could be add or 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 subtract, and they will deal with you know register input operands, write the result into registers as well, and then you'll have you know loads and stores, which will exchange values between memory and registers. Okay, and so you know, as I said, you know, here's your register file, you know, here's your main memory, and here's some value in memory that you care about. Okay, so what you're specifying over here is the address of that location in main memory, right? So as I said, your main memory could be really large, and this value that you're interested in could be sitting at a location, say, you know, 1.1 gigabytes. Now, some place has to store that location as well. And that is also stored in some register entry over here, right? So R7, for example, might have the value, you know, 1.1 gig sitting over here. So your load instruction will say, you know, first read R7. R7 has a memory address in it, and that's the address that I care about. Now go to that memory address, get the value, and put it in some register entry. Okay, so... Uh, your load instruction will first involve you reading the value R7. You can also do some fancy arithmetic. You could add 8 to it. You could say that you know 1.1 gig is kind of the point is, is is the start of my stack, and what I care about is some variable that is perhaps sitting you know 8 bytes away from the start of my stack. So get the value in R7, add 8 to it. That gives me a pointer to the value that I care about. Now get that value and put it in R4. So that's what a load instruction is doing in this case. Okay, and then, so, you know, R7 is an input to this load instruction, and the output of this instruction is going into R4. A store instruction, on the other hand, you know, could be doing, you know, something similar again, but there are two inputs in this case, right? There's a value in R5 that I want to store away in memory, so that's an input. I need to have that value before I can execute this instruction. Likewise, I also need to have you know, uh, I need to have the location in memory that I'm writing this result into. And that location is in R6. So I'm getting the value in R6. I need to add an offset of 24. Then I'll get the value R5 in the register file. And then I'll store this value away into main memory. Okay, so there are two inputs. And the output, in some sense, is um, a value being written into main memory. Okay, so this is what a load and a store instruction looks like. Okay, so now if you go back to the pipeline, the ALU stage is where I do my address calculation, right? So if I had an instruction that said, you know, load 8, R4, and then R5, in the register read stage, I'm going to read R4. In this ALU stage is where I do R4 plus 8. That gives me an address. I'm now going to use that address to go look up my data memory, get some value, and that value I now store over here in the slash. Right, some value, let's say that, so this is essentially a pointer into my main memory, into this location, and what I'm storing in that location could be a number, say, 73. Right, and so, and, you know, this location could be, as I said, you know, 1.1 1 .1, uh, gigabytes, or actually 1.1 1 .1 gigabyte plus 8 bytes. You know, the value in R4 could be 1.1 1 .1 gig, right, so what I've got over here is 1.1 1 .1 gig, I do 1.1 gig plus 8 over here, 
that's the address I'm storing over here. Then I go and fetch that value from data memory and I get the result 73, which I store in this latch for now. And then in this stage, I store that into register R5. S similar thing with stores as well. With the store, I might be doing, you know, 24 R6, comma, you know, R7. So if that store is going through over here in this stage, I'm going to read R6 and I'm going to read R7. In this stage, I'm going to do R6 plus 24. And then in this data memory stage, the value R7, which has just been moving from, you know, latch to latch, is now going to get written into the address that I just calculated over here, and which I saved over here. Okay, and now a store in this stage has to do nothing. Because in this stage, you write into a register entry and the store does not write to a register entry. So it does nothing in stage five. Okay, so that's how a load and a store would basically flow through the pipeline. And as I explained, you know, this is a very, uh, this, this is an important component of any risk processor. Now you need loads and stores to exchange values between the main memory and the register file. And then ultimately, you know, most of your math then happens on register values. Okay, so now we've kind of gone through the details of the pipeline for all kinds of instructions including loads and stores and regular ALU instructions. And in the next video, I'll start going through you know, various kinds of hazards and conflicts and other complexities uh, that are introduced by these pipelines.